Mr. Khan, you're very welcome to RT International. Thank you for your time today. My pleasure. <laughs> On both a political and human level, it's been an extraordinary and, I imagine, stressful week for you, culminating today in an Islamabad court extending a no-arrest bail for seven more days. So, firstly, how are you? Well, in some ways, uh, it's the best of times. and some ways, it's the worst of times. Why is it the best of times? Because uh, since I left office four months back, never has there been such a public response for, for any political party as it is for my party today. So in that sense, you know, it's for us, for a political person who's struggled for 26 years to raise awareness amongst the public, I think it's, it is uh, one of the best times for us. For my party, for me, it's, it's very satisfying to see a politically aware public understanding issues coming out on streets by themselves to stand up for their rights. Uh, on the, the other hand, uh, it's a bad time in Pakistan because we, have, uh, we are descending into fascism. We have uh, a government which has no credibility amongst the people. Uh, it, it is, it, we call it an imported government. It, uh, uh, the economy has tanked. Inflation has gone through the roof. It has lost all credibility. And so it is compensating uh, by, um, by the lack of credibility, by imposing this draconian measures on us. On the, they are clamping down on the media. They are clamping down against journalists. They've uh, instituted various uh, cases against me. One of them is a terrorism uh, case, which is, uh, you know, which is actually a joke. So, so it's bad in a way that the government is panicking. They are they're watching us grow in popularity. We, we swept the <clears throat> by-elections in the biggest province in Punjab. There, there were the two by-elections which we swept. So they are a bit scared, and that's why they're clamping down. Since your speech on Saturday, where the opposition is alleging that you threatened the police and members of the judiciary, they have essentially been labelling you a, a terrorist. On terrorism charges is what you would be standing on. As someone who led the country just months ago, what do you feel when you hear that allegation against you? Well, let me, for your viewers, let me put it in context. One of my, the, the chief of my staff, of my office, he was picked up. He, he made a remark on television which, which was misconstrued as if he's trying to stir mutiny in the, in the army. Uh, but it's debatable. He never got a, he still hasn't got a chance to clarify what he said. He was actually talking about rule of law. They picked him up, they abducted him. Two days, they kept him and tortured him. Uh, they uh, sexually tortured him. And, and uh, so what happened was that this now, this report is now in the, in, in the uh, high court of the torture of this, uh, of my aide, which is Shabazz Gill. And so my, I, I made two remarks. I said, we will not, we will not spare those people who are responsible, i.e. the police chief and, uh, and, his, and his second in command. We said we would take legal action against them. And then there was this magistrate who, knowing that this, uh, he was tortured, still sent him back to the police. So we said we would take legal action against both the magistrate and the, the, the police. Now, this does not constitute terrorism. But they have now, they are so desperate, they have made this into a terrorism case. They banned my live coverage on, 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 um, on screen. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and they are trying to uh, ban me from politics because there's a case uh, of contempt against me. So it is, uh, 
what I feel is desperation because this does not constitute uh, terrorism in any sense of the word. You are asking to take legal action against those officials who allowed this torture, torture which is banned in Pakistan, this does not mean that you're a terrorist. So, um, uh, but it's their desperation. They, they are petrified that if elections take place, we will sweep the elections. That's what I was going to ask. Your supporters say this is all a campaign by the ruling leadership to remove you from the political landscape altogether. So who or what, in your view, is behind this campaign to silence you? Well, the government. Uh, the government is behind it because, uh, you know, they came in through a conspiracy and the conspiracy was uh, foreign-backed. And, and then they, well, what they expected was that once I was removed, uh, I would lose uh, uh, all popularity amongst the public. Normally when a government goes, people distribute sweets. So they expected that, you know, this would just die down, my party would disappear, break up. But the reverse happened. People came out on the streets. Millions of people came out on the streets when I was removed, protesting against uh, this. It's never happened in Pakistan before that a government goes and people come out on the streets to protest. And then, as I said before, uh, we had massive rallies. They tried to crack down on us, thinking that they would scare us. But the rallies increased. We, uh, out of the 20 by-elections in Punjab, we swept 15. And then there were two other by-elections which we won. So this has scared them. They are now fearing that if, whenever the next elections are, which, which are the outside are in, in a year's time, they are petrified that when the elections take place, they will be wiped out. So that's why they're trying to uh, take these measures. And it's, it's really the government and, and its backers. They're all worried. Well, allow me to delve into some of the issues you've brought up. If we go back, Mr. Khan, to when you were ousted from power in the springtime, you've mentioned several times that certain documents exist that confirm foreign interference in your removal from power. Are you in any position to tell us what those documents may be? Well, there's a, there's a cipher, the conversation between the Pakistan ambassador in Washington and the Under Secretary of State uh, uh, of, of, the U, of the US. There's a conversation between them where he threatens the Pakistani ambassador that unless I, Imran Khan, was removed as a prime minister, in a no-confidence uh, motion that, were, that still wasn't tabled as yet, that there would be consequences for Pakistan. And he cites the trip by the trip I took to Russia. Uh, he cites that as one of the reasons. So uh, we, that cipher exists. I, I brought it in front of the cabinet. I, we, I presented it to the National Security Council because it was blatant interference from outside. Because after the cipher, the no confidence motion was tabled against me. And then suddenly, uh, Members of my uh, party started leaving, and our, our, our uh, allies started abandoning us, and all triggered off after that. So, uh, the U.S. Embassy was meeting members of our political party, who were the ones who jumped f ship first. And this is a few months before this, this happened. So uh, we, the, the president of Pakistan has sent that cipher to the, to the chief justice of Pakistan. And he's asked him to conduct an inquiry into this foreign interference, into this regime change. The West has made many attempts to pressure Pakistan to change its neutrality on the Ukraine conflict. Why do you think that bothers them so much? Isn't one of the main pillars of Western democracy the right to determine a national path so countries like Pakistan can make their own choices in their own national interests? Well, look, you know, countries' foreign policy must be for the benefit of their own public. 220 million Pakistanis elected me. My priority had to be their, what is good for them. Um, 
their benefit, their rights, their interests. That has to be my priority. And so when I took the trip to Russia, and this was all the stakeholders were on board, the idea was that we would improve our relationship with Russia and we would, uh, you know, we have trading links with Russia. We want to improve the trading links. We had already, we, there was a, a, a pipeline, a gas pipeline was, uh, was being planned five, six years back before I came to power. So we wanted to uh, uh, cement that contract and then we wanted to buy cheaper oil from, uh, from Russia as well as wheat because we, you know, we, we have to buy about two million tons of wheat. We, there's a shortage in Pakistan. But more importantly, at this time, when the commodity super cycle was taking place, when the energy prices were sky high, we wanted to buy cheaper Russian oil like India. India is buying uh, 30 to 40 percent discount rate oil from Russia. So we wanted to do the same because 100 million Pakistanis are vulnerable. 50 million below the poverty line, 50 million just above the poverty line. So when the, when the prices go up, when inflation bites, in Western countries, they, only, they just have a drop in the standard of living. In our country, people go below the poverty line. They can't have two square meals a day. So my interest was the people of Pakistan. Hmm. And obviously, this didn't go down well. Well, just a couple more points on that. Western countries are trying to isolate Moscow and make it a pariah. But the outcomes, I would suggest, are pretty negative for everyone involved when you sanction a country like Russia. The energy crisis in Europe now proves the point. Is that fair towards Russia? And why does the West attempt to drag Pakistan into this? You see, the, the, the problem uh, developing countries like ours, the problems we face, the biggest problem is that Western countries expect their problems to, to become our problems. So this is basically a, a, a European problem. It's not Pakistan's problem. What are Pakistan's problems? The Western countries don't con consider their own problems. So for instance, there is a conflict uh, between Pakistan and India about Kashmir. Uh, for, for, since 1948, there's a UN Security Council re resolution which makes Kashmir a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. And the people of Kashmir, through a plebiscite, were supposed to decide whether they wanted to be with India or Pakistan. And in the last 30 years, 100,000 Kashmiris have died in this uh, struggle for independence. So whenever we go to uh, uh, world forums or we talk to the Western country leaders, we talked ab uh, about what's happening in Kashmir, human right abuses. India has taken away the statehood of Kashmir in 2019, August, and unconstitutionally, uh, illegally, yet no one responds to this. No one thinks of sanctioning India. No one thinks of condemning India. Yet when this is a European conflict, you know, forget about the, the moral morality of the conflict. But the fact is, it is not Pakistan's conflict. Yet they want us to take a position on this and condemn Russia. My point is that condemning Russia, you have to have the luxury to condemn countries on moral issues. We don't have that luxury. You know, condemning countries can cost our people a lot. It can push people below the poverty line. Therefore, we want the luxury to be neutral. And that's what we want, I think, and that's what India did. India is a, is a strategic partner of the US, and yet it is trading with, with, with Russia. It's buying their oil, and, and, and it stays neutral. But it can, doesn't but condemn can, Russia, or it's, it just says we are neutral. Can Pakistan withstand yep. that pressure though can, can it can it stand up and say it's not necessary to choose sides we're going to act in our own national interest first that's what every country should have the right to do if you have 100 million people who are vulnerable they should become your priority and we should be able to tell a superpower like the united states that look you know uh, you know we would like to take positions but unfortunately, our situation 
does, does, does not allow us to take positions. So allow us the luxury to be neutral. You know, we became a partner, just for, your, uh, for the RT viewers. Mm -hmm. We joined the US war on terror, terror after 9-11. We became their partner. The total number of people who died in the Twin Towers, the tragic uh, 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 event, the terrorist attack that took place in Twin Towers, were less than 3,000. Pakistan, when it participated in the US war on terror, 80,000 Pakistanis were killed. We were, our country was devastated. Three and a half million people were internally displaced. We had over a hundred billion dollars lost to the economy. So Pakistan paid a huge price for participating in someone else's war. And my point is that we should not, countries which have huge amounts of poverty like our countries, vulnerable people, you know, who, who, who should be our main priority, mm. we should not be able to, we should not be forced into other people's conflicts. Uh, just another aspect on this, if I may. Is the blame on Russia, essentially, for all of the world's energy woes right now, a little too convenient, seeing as we've just come through two years of extreme uh, COVID lockdowns? You, of course, saw that at first hand, being Pakistan prime minister during all that time. So, so what, sorry, what did you want me to ask? What was the question? Is the, the fact that the West is blaming Russia for all of the energy woes around the world right now, is that a little bit too convenient? You see, uh, fr frankly, I'm, uh, I don't believe uh, resolving issues through conflicts. Although, you know, there are two sides of the argument in this, uh, in, in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Russian, uh, when I met President Putin, he talked about security of, uh, of Russia, which was, which was his biggest uh, issue. And that's why, you know, he gave all the reasons how he sent signals and warnings, and he had understandings with Western leaders about why it was important for, for, for Russia to have a, a zone which was demilitarized. And on the other hand, the Western view is very simple. They think that there's a aggression. Uh, my, my, I have always inherently believed that co military solutions are always uh, uh, counterproductive because I always believe that you, you uh, go into a conflict to resolve one issue and then a military uh, uh, intervention leads to other issues. And so I've opposed basically the Iraq war, I oppose the war in Afghanistan. Uh, and, I, and I feel that you know, it's not the way, but you know, we want to stay out of it because there are two points of views. The one Russian point of view and one is the European point of view. And so people like us, countries like us, should have the luxury of staying out of it. Mm. Hey, you have been criticized for being too close to Russia and President Putin. How is your relationship now with Vladimir Putin? Well, I've only met uh, uh, President Putin twice. Once was at a conference in Bishkek, and the second time was this meeting. Um, I didn't realize that when we would reach there, and the next morning when I was going to have my meeting with him, there would, uh, there would be this uh, uh, invasion in Ukraine. I didn't expect it. So. Uh, you know, I had a long chat with President Putin. My main interest is really our relation, Pakistan relationship with Russia. Because in the future, uh, there's a, Pakistan can gain a lot from this relationship. And I, I repeat, we have our energy needs, gas. Secondly, we uh, oil from Russia. And then thirdly is wheat. Pakistan is a country of 220 million people growing fast. And we have this shortage of wheat, which is, you know, as you know, is essential mm. for basic staple diet of our, of our population. So yeah, my whole idea was cementing our relationship in these terms, in trading terms, mutually beneficial for both. OK, if we can return to your situation now, sir, um, if you stand trial in the High Court next week and are convicted, you would be disqualified for life from politics uh, as no convicted person can run for office. But is going to court something you will have to do 
at some stage if you want to become prime minister again? Uh, look, you know, I don't know how the court is going to do this. I mean, even any court, how are they going to convict someone for saying that they would take legal action against those responsible for perpetuating Hello? torture, custodial torture? It's banned. So how is anyone going to ban me on terrorism because I'm saying that there's custodial torture and we will take legal action against those responsible? That's exactly what I said. How can anyone be banned for this? How can anyone be banned, even convicted for terrorism for saying that? So it's, I don't know what they would be. I think if they go that far, I, I just think that there will be a huge commotion in the country. People are never going to accept it. You mentioned you were barred from the airwaves, sir. Does not having access to television, does that affect your fight and your supporters fight greatly? Because I know your social media presence is huge. 17 and a half million followers on Twitter, for instance. Do you need to be on television at all? Well, <laughs> social media, you know, that's, uh, that's something which... Uh, all uh, fascist regimes that try to clamp down on information, it's very difficult for them to clamp down on social media. And they have tried. I mean, this government, during my speech, they tried to, uh, uh, they disrupted YouTube for a while because they banned me on television. So on YouTube, they tried to cause disruption. But it's very difficult. I mean, this, this length they will have to go to clamp down on social media is going to be very difficult. Even media, I think, for a while, for, for, for some time, they, they might just temporarily they've clamped down on it. But electronic media eventually depends on viewership. And the, 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 out of so many channels, the one or two channels that show us, their viewership goes through the roof. So the other uh, TV channels are going to lose money if they don't show the, the party that is by far the most popular party the only federal party in the country. It's just not, you know, commercially it won't make sense to them. So I don't think it's, it, the government is in a fix. They are panicking, and in panic they are taking these uh, ridiculous fascist measures. But this is no solution. They can't stop the popularity of a party growing by taking these uh, decisions, and especially if they think that uh, even if they clamp down on the electro electronic media, the social media is something they can't stop, they can't clamp down on for, for any uh, length of time. What will you do next week if that bill does not change and you're being forced to go to court? Will you go? Well, I, I, I have to go to court. Uh, I have got now this uh, hearing on the 30th, so mm -hmm. yes, I'll be going to court. Look. All my life, let me just say, all my life, I have always stayed within the law. In politics, I've been for 26 years. I have always, all my protests, everything have between the, uh, between the limits of the law I, and limits of the Constitution. Because I, I am a constitutionalist. I'm a Democrat. And I don't believe that, you know, you should go outside the Constitution because then you open up a Pandora's box. And so what they're doing right now is trying to corner me with this case. They will find it very difficult because the people of this country have known me for 50 years. I mean, before I joined politics, I was one of the top sports stars in this country for, for two decades. Mm. So they know me for a long time. So it's not going to be very easy for them just to, uh, to ban me. It's, you know, people won't accept it. You've called the whole process leading Pakistan into, it looks like a banana republic from the outside. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, for a start, I, what they did with my uh, chief of staff, Shabazz Gill, you don't just, and he, you know, he's an assistant. He was an assistant professor in, in an American university. So he, he was just picked up, abducted, 
and tortured and then sexually abused. So this, I mean, doesn't happen in civilized societies. But the worst thing is that, uh, you know, when I wanted to uh, have uh, legal proceedings against the police and those who were responsible, they then slapped this terrorism case on me. This doesn't happen in a civilized society. So that's what I meant by a banana republic. We're descending these guys, this government of crooks. By the way, 60% of the government is on bail on corruption charges. Uh, so they are so desperate that they are taking all these measures, uh, which is taking Pakistan and making it into a banana republic. But are you not concerned that the, the amount of your followers on the streets constantly is going to make that situation worse? Look, I mean, if they take a ridiculous step, uh, how would I know what the followers would react? But all I know is that the night they were going to uh, come to uh, arrest me, thousands of people just appeared outside my house and surrounded my house. And not just there, in cities, thousands of uh, people just came out on the streets. So, you know, because they know, I mean, the people know what is going on. The level of political awareness is so much because of social media, because of the mobile phone. Everyone knows what's going on. So the response was immediate. The moment my arrest warrants came out, the response just w was immediate in the streets. So, you know, if they go the same direction, I can't say what will happen, but I feel that uh, there will be immense, huge, unprecedented street protests. And do you think that the current government is going to try something else to, to clamp down on your supporters to silence those people? <clears throat> well, they already have, you know, on 25th May when my, we were conducting a peaceful protest. I mean, the sort of clamp down, they put thousands of people in jail. They, uh, I mean, they raided people's houses at night. It's never happened before. You know, it was like as if we were terrorists. It was a peaceful protest. Uh, and, you know, when I was in government three and a half years, there were three times they were, they were sort of sitting in Islamabad against my government. We never stopped anyone. We never uh, 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 charged any people. We never put people in jails. But this government, you know, on 25th of May, which was a, a, a black day for us, they really, I mean, they injured people, two people died, so many people got injured, and they put people in jail. It was a proper clampdown. So that's desperation. And just uh, finally, because you've been very good with your <clears throat> time, how do you see this playing out? By, by what you've been saying, you're not going to stand down from the uptick in the opposition's reaction. They don't look as if they're going to. Sir, how does this play out in your opinion? There is only one solution. At the moment, our economy has gone down. We have unprecedented inflation, what is called the consumer price index. When we were in power, and remember, this is despite the commodity super cycle uh, all over the world, ours was 16%. Today, the consumer price index has crossed 42%. So inflation has gone through the roof. People are hurting. The electricity prices, you know, the, 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 when, they, when the electricity uh, bills came, there are protests going all over Pakistan. People can't afford electricity. It's again more than doubled since we left. In four months, it's more than doubled. So the, the inflation has hit the sky. Economy is tanking. Our exports are going down. You know, our, uh, there's unemployment now because the industries are closing because of these heavy costs and unpredictability. So, the only solution where Pakistan is today are free and fair elections. Nothing else will, is going to resolve this problem. There's political instability in Pakistan, which means that the economy won't stabilize. Economic stability depends on political stability. And right now, our economy is tanking. There's no one, ha no one knows what's going to happen in the, in the one month, two months from now. Okay. And so the only solution, as I, I repeat, is only solution to get political stability are free and fair elections. 
Well, we thank you greatly for coming on RT International and sharing your views with us today. Imran Khan, former Prime Minister of Pakistan, thank you for your time and your thoughts. Thank you.